Welcome to episode 494. This week, Jerry Falwell is doing damage control following his profile in Vanity Fair. We look at how nepotism and populism may explain his behavior. Then a researcher argues that a toxic reaction to the religious right can explain a whole bunch of what's going on in our culture right now. And a new study finds that Republicans tend to adopt the moral beliefs of their candidates, while Democrats project their moral beliefs onto their candidates. Then I talk with Dan Kimball about his new book, How Not to Read the Bible. Here is episode 494. Hey there, welcome back to the show. This is Phil Vischer. You're listening to the Holy Post Podcast, coming to you live on tape from uh, West Chicago, Illinois, West Aurora, Illinois, Wheaton, Illinois, and Christian Taylor, where are you? Polson, Montana. And Polson, Polson, P O L S O N. Yes, Polson. Yeah, it's where Flathead Lake is, and if you've never been here, it's gorgeous. Mm. It's a huge it? lake in Montana. Beautiful. Is it big sky country? Looks like it. The sky looks very big. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the sky is bigger in Montana. I'm not sure how they do that. What kind of trick is it <laughs> to make the sky bigger? Sky, can... can you explain us? Because your name is Sky. <laughs> <laughs> so you understand the bigness of sky. sky. Yeah, sky needs to get a little less big. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> got some work to do. Um, <laughs> How do you make your sky bigger? I, isn't it just like this, that? You did. There's less visual obstruction, but I've never been to Montana, so I can't. Well, actually, the sky that. in Wyoming, in my experience, looks bigger because there's more open space and it's like a lot flatter and it just seems like the sky goes on forever. But Montana is similar okay. because there's just a lot of flat land and then you have oh, these mountains. Is Wyoming big sky country? Was I wrong? Is it Wyoming? No, that's... it's Montana. You're right. Oh, Montana's just, big sky country. I'm just what's saying Wyoming's, it's what's Wyoming's slogan? Next to big sky country? The equality state. Is it really? Really? Yes. Women first got to vote there. Oh. Wow. Well, I'll just shut up. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And now the theme song. (laughs) What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post, and sometimes Christian. Sky, you just got back from uh, a whirlwind tour of the middle of California, right? Yeah, first I was in Santa Barbara, and then I went up to Visalia, which is in the middle of the Central Valley. Is that Visalia? Is that an onion? Isn't that the name of an onion? That's Vidalia. Oh, Vidalia is the onion. Okay. Which I think there's a city in Georgia. Name Visalia, isn't that that big uh, palace in France? That's Versailles. Oh, Versailles. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. So this is completely different than the palace or the onion. Yeah, I had never been to Central California like that before in the Valley. And I, I was saying to you earlier, it feels like they took a chunk of the Midwest and just yeah. plopped it in the middle of California. So it felt like home. And, except and the palm would you tree say there. that's a good thing or a bad thing? No, I mean... What was your it, impression, Sky? Did you I, like it? Yeah, I liked it. It's a nice place. And I mean, you can see mountains in the distance, which I guess makes it a little different than the Midwest. Yeah. But, you know, you, people just have a stereotype of California. They think of LA or they think of San Francisco and the Bay Area, but they right. forget about the middle. Right. Which is this amazing agricultural sort force. Of, sort of like American politics today. Yes. You well forget put. about the middle. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to bring up, I don't, I'm not doing news of the butt. I did it two weeks in a row. And Dang that, it. Oh, that, Phil. I'm not news <laughs> of the butt. Christian's thinking I've her decided, strategy has worked. Yeah, I, I've decided. I've decided I'm going to embrace news of the butt. I'm going to love it. Really? And embrace the butt. Embrace, embrace the butt. The butt. Yes. Well, I'm not going to do one today. And I actually had another one. I had another one, but I said, no, no, I'm going to take a little break. I'm going to take a little break. Dang it. So I, okay. Well, I appreciate that. That makes me feel warm all the way down to my butt. Okay. Um, (laughs) Jason, did you walk today? Did you walk today, Jason? Not yet. We're recording a lot earlier than normal. So I'm I'm like, yeah, that's true. But he did walk yesterday evening because I got a little notification on my watch. So great job, Jason. Great job, Jason. 
I think all of America should get notifications on their watches when Jason walks. <laughs> Is there a way to set that up? I, I'd, I'd also I, like one when he eats a cinnamon roll to see. Yeah, a different like, notification. Yeah. I could probably just tweet it. <laughs> That's it. The yin and the yang. Um, I'm flying. We're recording early because I have to hop on a plane and fly to Washington, D.C. I've been summoned by the president for oh, a high year. I thought maybe from the for the January 6th commission, they want to interrogate oh, yeah. you. Yeah. What was your role? What did you, why didn't you do something? Couldn't you have done more to prevent this calamity? No, I'm speaking at an event uh, with BioLogos. The BioLogos group uh, was founded by Francis Collins and works mm -hmm. on bringing peace between the Bible and science. Faith and science can live together peacefully without throwing furniture. That's why they exist. And our friend John Walton is heavily involved in BioLogos. Uh, he's done a bunch of their events. And so I'm doing an event. What do you know? What do you what know about your, that? What is your Logos going to be for this BioLogos event? <laughs> uh, I'm the MC of the event. Okay. That's my role. <laughs> I'm just I'm just there to introduce things and and then but this is will be the highlight. You know Francis Collins, doctor, he's been on the show. Mm -hmm. Us, uh, he's he sings and he plays the guitar, and twice he's done original songs that he has written together with N. T. Wright, and they both get guitars and they sing them together. Wow! So, so they asked me if I wanted to do that with Doctor Collins to write and perform a song with him live. And your ukulele? Um, actually, I, I'm going to do guitar because I wrote the song. So, but, so I wrote a song. I wrote a song to sing with Dr. Collins. Wow. I'm a little bit nervous about it because, you know, he's kind of an important person. That might be the least romantic duet I can think of. <laughs> And N.T. Wright and Francis Collins or me and Francis Collins? You and Francis Collins. Oh, thank you. Yeah, there's uh -huh. definitely more romance in N.T. Wright and Francis I, Collins. Is that I, what you're saying? His theology kind of gets me going. Now, oh, Phil, boy. I'm just going to tell you, all of our listeners are going to show up on Twitter and they're going to no. say, we want to hear the song, no. play the no. song. Is it gonna, no. Yeah, is this broadcast no. anywhere? Is it going to be recorded no. anywhere? It will be recorded. And I think BioLogos will post it at some point in the future. But I, think I also like think you should do a out. special private version for our Patreon supporters. That's my vote. I, I can't do a private special version of a of a duet with someone who wouldn't be there to do the special private version. <laughs> True, but but you could sing it yourself. You know, you're not such yeah. a bad singer. Yeah, uh, yeah. Except we each have parts. Like we we say things about each other in it. Oh, it's you is know? it a comedy one? Kind of. I don't know. It sounds kind of romantic. I think no. you and Francis Collins should be like going around at tables at Valentine's Day and serenading couples. Uh -huh. I think I think Francis Collins and I should just perform. We don't talk about Bruno, and then everyone has to figure out who's the Bruno in this scenario. It's obviously Donald Trump. We don't talk about Bruno. No, no. I've been singing that with my granddaughter, like all. The last two weeks we've been seeing we don't talk about Bruno. Anyway, all's well that falls well. I wanted to talk just a little bit about Jerry Falwell Jr. because Sky got to talk about him at great length with David French on Friday. If you didn't listen to last week's French Friday, you should because it was a fascinating conversation. But some more has even happened since then which, you know, Sky didn't know about it because he was in the Midwest of California where they don't have news, uh, but he's just catching up. So I am catching up. Okay, so Jerry Falwell Jr. for some reason decided to give a massive amount of interviews to Vanity Fair who would not be, you know, oh, I bet they'll, I bet they like me. I bet Vanity Fair is big fans <laughs> <laughs> of the Falwell family and Falwell traditions. So, so he did that. And he gave some startling quotes, like, you know, the one that caught everyone's attention. Uh, people think I'm a religious person, but I'm not. Like, oh, okay. You know, which led um, uh, Russell Moore to, to write simply, how can the chancellor of one of the world's largest Christian universities justify his behavior by saying he's not religious? How does that even happen? How do we get there? So, and that was part of your conversation was, you know, like, is it, was, is it negligence on the part of the board to have him there? Right. When his behavior seems to indicate he's not 
uh, terribly committed to, to Christian life and practice. Uh, and then he even says so. Right. Yeah. So, uh, but apparently the article came out and people were so up in arms about that, that he felt the need to defend himself. So he tweeted um, late last week, a statement of faith, effectively a statement of faith saying, oh, people made such a big deal out of me saying I'm not religious, but here's what I believe. And it kind of reads like uh, he copied and pasted it from some church's website. It's just kind of a statement of faith. (laughs) Mm-hmm. This is what I believe. I am totally Orthodox Christian. And then he ends by saying, and he loves the people of his brother's church. Uh, uh, what's it? Something Road? What road? Baptist Thomas Church? Thomas Road, I yes, think. Yes, Thomas Road Baptist Church, yeah. his dad's church that his brother took over. And um, and, and I, so I just wondered, reading that, like, who told him, hey, you have to say, you have to tell people that you're a Christian. Who says this? Does this make things better or worse? (laughs) I mean, seriously, like if somebody's being accused of sexual impropriety, covering up sexual abuse at their institution, uh, financial shenanigans, all kinds of really gross behavior, and they say, I'm not religious, you go, okay. If they say, no, 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 I absolutely believe everything about Jesus the Bible teaches, and you go, oh, like, yeah. You know, it's kind of yeah. like the hypocrisy gets heightened doesn't, then. Doesn't so help. I have a question. Yes, Christian. Can you, do you know if Vanity Fair paid them for the article? No, I don't think that would be ethical. Because he demonstrated, I think in that tweet, correct me if I'm wrong, a little bit of loyalty mm. to Vanity Fair because he was saying that Vanity Fair got everything right, but everybody that posted after was twisting what Vanity Fair said. And so I, I do find that interesting that they decide to do an interview with Vanity Fair and thinking that they're going to be, you know, not, I don't know, negative. And now yeah, he's standing no, by he them. didn't. He didn't seem to complain about anything Vanity Fair said he said. He wasn't disputing how he was quoted. So the question is, in his mind, what does it mean to say you're not a religious person as a defense? of your behavior while running a Christian university. What did he think that meant that other people, because other people clearly said, wait a minute, the son of Jerry Falwell is not a Christian. He's like, no, no, that's not what I meant. I meant I'm not someone who cares about morality. I'm like, what did he, (laughs) what did he mean? But but wait a second. I have a question. (laughs) So if people asked me if I was religious and maybe I'm wrong, but I would say, no, I'm not a religious person. Because for me, religion is a man-made construct. Yeah, that's because you've been reading Sky Jatani. So I think I think you're, <laughs> I don't true. think Jerry Falwell Jr. has been reading Sky Jatani. To Again, shape I hope not, because that would make of- things worse. <laughs> well, if he was reading Sky Jatani, it'd actually make things better, okay. I would argue. You know, when, when somebody asks me, are you religious? I usually reply with a question, which is, well, what do you mean by religious? Because on one level, yeah, absolutely. I'm very religious. But I would argue everyone is. It's just, what are you religious about, right? So the the, his There you go with your mind tricks again. I know. So now if if everyone is religious, then what does it even mean? Exactly. The the, the part I can't quite get, and, and David French brought this up in French Friday, is he goes after religion, he goes after organized religion, and he goes after religious elites. And he's he's head of the largest evangelical college in the country, and he's the definition of a religious elite, given what he's done with politics and the Trump campaign. And So how can you say you're against all the things that you in, embody? Yeah, he, seem, he seemed to say... I. I got to I got to admit when I read the Vanity Fair piece I felt a little sad for him you know I kind of because it's it's clear that he was so shaped by his parents in ways that I think he felt like he had no control of you know that that he just that he he was given a legacy that that almost uh defined his life path what he could and couldn't do um, so I kind of feel, and I'm trying to wrestle, I was wrestling with Donald Trump Jr. 
and Jerry Falwell Jr., you know, kind of the Trump kids and the Falwell kids in terms of completely domineering father figures that they're trying to please. You know, like like the Trump kids, it was it was said in one of the books about them uh, that their dad didn't really show interest in them until they could join him in business. Because he's a narcissist. It's well, on yes. his terms. Yeah. Yes. But if you're a kid growing up and you can't get your dad's attention unless you can join the family business, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering. And then Jerry Falwell Jr. was, was traveling the country with his dad, manning the merch table, you know, in the back and collecting all the money from his dad's books and, I don't know, t-shirts or whatever else he was selling. Um, so there's this, this, you know, there's the son that just wants to please the father, wants to get the father's attention, um, isn't, just isn't the father, but wants to get the father's attention. So there's a little bit of a tragic story. I do find a little tragedy yeah. in, in that story. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to shed any tears. I, I and here's why. I, I, I think there's a lot it. of people in ministry who have that story. Yeah, who, I remember being in a in a class in seminary, a small class, maybe five or six of us. I think it was a preaching like uh, lab kind of class. And on the first day, the prof asked us why we were in seminary, and one of the young men in there with me said, "My grandfather was a pastor, my father was a pastor, and I'm going to be a pastor." And you know, maybe maybe there's a real calling there. I don't know the guy, but I my instinct was dude might have daddy issues, right? Yeah, that doesn't sound like a calling. That sounds like an obligation. Right. So I think there's a lot of people who find themselves in ministry vocations for all kinds of different reasons. And some of them are wounds from parents and fathers and growing up in communities that expect these things of them. And that is painful and difficult. But, and that may well be the case with Jerry Falwell Jr. At the same time, he finds himself in a huge scandal that involves a lot of impropriety that no one forced him to do. Right. And it's a pretty good smokescreen to play the daddy card and say, my, look how terrible my upbringing was and I'm forced into this life. And it's like, okay, two things can mm -hmm. be true at the same time. You can be in a life that you didn't really choose for yourself. And you can also be a horrible person yeah. and do some really immoral, terrible things to other people. Yeah. There is Here's free will at the end of the day. Right. Is know, there no matter... though? Is there though, Christian? Because <laughs> well, you know, everything we think is a chemical reaction in our brains. Well, actually, Phil, that brings up a question that I did have. I do feel like there is some psychology at play here that I'm not a psychologist, so I don't understand, but I do, you know, I do see some warning signs there, and I see some similarities like you between Trump and Falwell, in that Falwell is basically saying, I'm not a, you know, a religious elite. I'm not that while actually being that. And Trump is over here saying, you know, right. I'm a millionaire. Yes, but I'm a common man. Right. I'm, I'm one not, of you. I'm not one of the elite. I'm one I'm, of you. Yeah, actually, that's a really good point, Christian. I've been reading a book about this, um, and we'll interview the author hopefully in a couple of weeks, about populism, the history of populism in American politics. And it, it, it's exactly that both Jerry Falwell and Trump are populists, where they are extremely elite in many, many ways, but they constantly want to tell people, no, 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 I'm just like you. And I'm actually your advocate. I'm for you. And it's all kind of a, it's a sham. But I think that's what Jerry Falwell Jr. was doing in this article is he was trying to identify with the kind of everyday Joe, the Trump kind of voter by saying, I'm not religious. I'm not elite. I, I hate those people too. I'm one of you be on my side. And it's hard to take him seriously. It's hard to believe it. Well, and here's another thing. I think the people that are the, you know, the common man, for lack of a better term, if they see a Trump or if they see a Falwell and they hear them saying they're like me, well, I want to be like them, you know, too, because they have this success and this power. And so they're the common man, but yet, you know, the world is their oyster. And maybe if we're on the same team, some of that may trickle down to me somehow. Right. Yeah, it's like when one of the inspirational thing. It's like when one of the cool kids in high school comes over to your lunch table and then starts making fun of the other cool kids' lunch table. It's like, oh, he's he's on our side against them. This is fantastic. Isn't right. it? Did you ever have that happen? To, or or Sky, you were at the cool kids' lunch table. Oh, so. Phil, 
You didn't Please. have that. You didn't know. <laughs> yes. Okay. Last thing I want to talk about about this story is nepotism. And here's why I wanted to bring it up. Because as you read the story, it, it becomes clear that Jerry Falwell Sr., you know, as he was getting older, he had two things that he had built, his church and his school. And he had two sons. And he was trying to figure out yes. which, which son will get which thing. Like those were the only options for secession. You know, I have two things. I have two sons. And I'm just wondering, like, okay, if you're, if you're a minister, you know, if, so if, you're, if you've started a church for the kingdom of God and you've started a school for the kingdom of God, why would you think those things can only go to your own progeny? Where does that come? Because it, it made me think of Bob Jones University mm -hmm. also. It's like Bob Jones. Oh, this will go to Bob Jones Jr. And then who will he give it to? Bob Jones the third. And if there's another Bob Jones, then they'll get like, where does that come from where we think our ministries belong to us? And so they must, they're like family businesses, you know, like grocery stores or car dealerships, and we must keep them in the family. I think there's a trust issue. And I, you know, I've actually been thinking about this in terms of my own thing I created. So I have this property, this business, this, you know, thing that's a passion project for me. and it's going to live on beyond me, you know, in some way. And who am I going to give the responsibility of that to? Well, probably my oldest son who cares about it like I do and can manage it better than I do. And so I think there may have been, you know, some sort of thinking like that. Well, I know these people. I trust these people. They're my children. They have a vested interest in these things continuing. That's why. You don't agree? <laughs> I, I just I just don't know why you would conclude that of of you know f seven billion people on Earth, uh, it has to be one of my sons that's most qualified to pastor this church or be chancellor of this college. I think it's different when you're talking about a family business uh -huh, than right than a ministry for that's every the, for for right. the world. Yeah, that that's where the the breakdown and and to be fair, a college, university, church, ministry, whatever, it, it's a nonprofit. It should have a board of directors that is the top authority overseeing that thing, and it's the board of directors who ought to be picking who's the pastor or who's the CEO or who's the the president of that institution. And when it always happens to be the, a child of the founder, that's a little fishy. Yeah, yeah, but makes, oftentimes they pack boards with yes men. Right, exactly. That's the fishy part is rather than being a truly independent board that's looking out for the best interests of the mission, they are yes men and women who are there to aggrandize the founder. Well, and that's why I say that even though, yes, a church and a school are different than a product, if you're not thinking of it as a church or a school that's different than a product, then you think of it the way that I would think of it as a product. The other thing I find fascinating is how he thought about which son would get which thing. Mm -hmm. That was fascinating, I thought well, too. Yeah, it's it's just like this this son is less like me, but more religious. So he'll be he'll get the church. This son is more like me and very ambitious financially. So he'll get the largest university in the Christian world. That's training. That's mission is creating champions for Christ. That's the mission of <clears throat> Liberty University. Which, but, but he's not religious. But he's not religious. <laughs> no, no. But Christ, you know, Christ doesn't mind because Christ wants to win. If there's one thing that Jesus <laughs> wants more than anything else, it's to be on the winning team. And that's why we're creating champions for him so that we can make Christ a winner. Hmm. Why do you think it's important to him that he thinks that, and I'm asking you, I know you started with this question, but why is it important to him that he say, I am a Christian? Uh, yeah, I assume there was significant social capital at risk yes. by opting out of the entire movement. 
but he's not running a school anymore. He's not really doing anything in quote unquote the Christian. He's going to he maybe do, do something. What yeah. about the political? So that's where I think you know if he's aligned with Donald Trump and the religious right or whatever. If he says I'm no longer religious or I'm no longer a Christian, does that mean he's out? Yeah. Uh, well, it certainly affects your street cred at, you know, at Christian conservative rallies to have said, I'm not a religious person. Like, wait, well, then why are you speaking at my church? Get out of here. We don't trust non-religious people. That means you're an atheist. I mean, if someone assumes, oh, Jerry Falwell Jr. just said he's an atheist, then I could see where he'd say, wait, 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 wait. I didn't say that. Atheists are Democrats. You know, that's like the worst (laughs) thing. I, you could assume that I'm liberal if I'm if I'm not a Christian, which brings me to the next story I wanted to discuss. Uh, Ruth Bronstein wrote in The Guardian um, a story that I thought was interesting. She said the backlash against right wing evangelicals is reshaping American politics and faith. And, and she's bringing together some themes that we've talked about before, but she's kind of pulling them all together um, in a way that I haven't seen someone address directly. She says, what if I were to tell you that the following trends in American religion were all connected? Rising numbers of people who are religiously unaffiliated or identify as spiritual but not religious. Also, a spike in positive attention to the religious left. And also, the depolitization of liberal religion and also the radicalization of the religious right. So she is proposing, theorizing, all of these things are connected. And what connects them all, um, she believes, is a backlash to the religious right. Um, She says there's a fair amount of study already that has identified the skyrocketing number of people disaffiliating with religion, saying I'm done with religion altogether, can be partly explained as political backlash against the religious right. So that's, we've talked about that. You know, people are saying, if this is what religion is, I'm done with it. Or if this is what Christianity is, I'm done with it. She says that's a... That's been documented since like the 1990s, at least. Yeah. She says, uh, she calls that a broad form of backlash where you just chuck the whole thing. You chuck the whole religious experiment because you don't like what those uh, religious people are doing. But then she says, this is not the only plausible form that backlash can take, a narrower, more targeted backlash against the religious right itself in which people don't abandon religion, but they migrate to more moderate or otherwise more appealing religious groups. And evidence of this also abounds. Um, So she says, since Donald Trump was elected president with the support of religious conservatives, typically low profile groups on the religious left have received a surge of positive attention as observers saw in them a means of checking the power of the religious right. So, you know, where mainstream publications have given more airtime to religious people, but religious people that aren't like Donald Trump. Um, and that's, I guess that's those, you know, evangelical elites that we've heard so much about Christian. I apologize for my lack of knowledge here, but can you please explain to me what the religious left is? Uh, well, it's not a tightly defined thing, but it would no doubt include many mainline Protestant churches. Um, and a lot of African American. And a lot of African American Protestant churches. So the religious left would be people that vote more progressively. Well, you could define it in two ways, just like the religious right. Is it a, is it a political definition or a theological definition? Is, are you conservative theologically and politically or theologically or politically? And then are you liberal politically, but conservative? It's so it's a little bit confusing. It's kind of um, sojourners. If you're yeah, familiar Jim, with Jim what's Wallace, his name? Tony yeah. Campolo, Red Letter Christians. So, and those are, you know, Red Letter Christians, Shane Claiborne, are fairly conservative theologically. I mean, they're not throwing out the virgin birth. They're not throwing right. out, you know, atonement. Um, but they are throwing out the connection between conservative theology and conservative politics. And And that's definitely true in a lot of Black Protestant Christianity, which, as we've talked about in the past, African Americans, when polled, have the most Orthodox Christian beliefs of any group in America. They engage the Bible more than any other Christians in America. They're more committed to church than any other Christians in America, but they vote overwhelmingly Democratic. So that's the religious left. So it's kind of a combination, really, in that 
you know, you you do believe the Bible. You are a Christian, but right. you are more social in your political affiliations. More progressive, more right? Pro and, progressive. Yeah. And okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. So uh, she also says new research finds that people who are both religious and politically liberal are intentionally distancing themselves from the religious right by depoliticizing their public religious expression. So what does that mean? So I'm I'm a strong Christian, but I'm not politically conservative. So I'm trying to create separation between politics and my faith. So I don't really have to talk about it at all because it gets ugly. <laughs> At Thanksgiving. Well, yeah. And I think part of it too, though, is if you are very religious and you're more politically progressive, if you depict yourself as religious in the public square, people assume you're conservatively political. Does that make sense? Yes. And so, so basically you're saying, I don't want to flaunt, not a, I'm not yeah. going to flaunt that I'm a Christian in the public square because people will think I'm a Trump conservative when That's in fact I'm not. Right. So I'm going to I'm going to be more circumspect about my religious depiction of myself in the public square because I don't want to be misidentified. Hmm. Yep. Okay. Yep. And then she says, finally, uh, the backlash is not a one way street. The experience of being the object of political backlash has led to a counter backlash among the conservative Christians who comprise the religious right. White evangelical Christians believe they are being illegitimately pro uh, persecuted and are increasingly invested in uh, policing the boundary between the perceived righteous and their enemies. Religious conservatives not committed to Trump and the Republican Party are being pushed out. Those who remain are not only deeply loyal to a shared political project, but are less likely to encounter internal checks on more radical ideas. So you're seeing what she's suggesting is partly because of the backlash against the religious right, the religious right may be becoming smaller as some people peel away, but it's also becoming more radicalized. Yeah, it's know? purer. Yes, it's purer and it's even more committed um, to everyone else as our enemy. And there's fewer checks because more moderates have left, checked out. There's fewer checks on more radical ideas. For example, over the weekend, there was a rally uh, of some QAnon supporters and General Kelly, who's way out there on the QAnon Christian nationalist front. Uh, and then after the rally, they had a march. It was in Arizona. They all had a march to the border wall where they carried assault rifles and sang Amazing Grace while marching back and forth at the border wall. Oh so, my gosh. So, and you have to wonder where were the people who would say, hey, this is crazy. Well, why are we marching at the border wall, at the Trump border wall with assault rifles while singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me? Do, doesn't anyone notice how crazy this is? And the reason no one said that is because all the people that would think that have already checked out of that movement. They've, they've yeah, left. That kind of reminds me of where we got with the Hillsborough Baptist Church. You know, it's it's so crazy that you mean most Westboro? everybody. Else, Isn't it yeah, Westboro? that's what I meant. Yeah, Not, yeah, Westboro. Westboro. Sorry about that, Hillsboro. If you exist. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Those those people just swallowed their tongues. <laughs> well, and what I am curious about is when they say this drives me insane. When they say we're being persecuted, and I've heard that actually ever since I was little. You know, with the left is persecuting us as Christians, and we have to stand up for our rights and everything we believe. And I, I just wonder, have they ever actually talked to Christians that were like actually persecuted for their beliefs? There's quite a difference, I would argue. Well, there, I don't know if you saw this last week. There was an article in a, a uh, one of the conservative journals um, attacking David French, our buddy, our French Friday buddy, as uh, he's not manly. Mm. And, you know, and he's a, you know, he's a, Iraq war veteran, you know, he's a lawyer who's defended religious freedom at great cost to himself. He's massively attacked for his opposition of Trump. And so but he's he, being persecuted, you're saying? He's being attacked as not manly. And do you know why he's not manly? Because he, because he criticizes white Christians who are persecuted in America and weak, and therefore to attack weak people like white Christians is not manly. Manly people attack powerful oh people. But that was the, the argument. The, the wow. irony is the people saying that are white 
Christian men who are claiming to be the victims of persecution, which doesn't that mean who are weak? Right. This is it's bizarre. The whole thing is utterly bizarre. Um, Okay, can I give my own little framework for for? I mean, I think the article is really interesting, and she makes some great points about how all these different pieces are connected. But one of the things I've been thinking a lot about are the people who are kind of abandoning white conservative evangelicalism, I've been trying to categorize them as well. Oh, good. Oh, let's hear it. Okay. So here are my three categories. Okay. And feel free to write in, disagree, explain why I'm wrong, or there's more nuance to this. I'm sure there's more nuance. Do I have to write in or can I just say what? Yeah, you have to be quiet and you can just write your complaints in the chat. (laughs) Okay. Okay. So everyone's watching what's been going on in white evangelicalism and people, people are checking out and I'd put them in into at least three buckets. The first bucket I call disbelievers. And these are people who I think really don't want to follow Jesus. Maybe they were raised in the church, religious family, whatever. They've never really bought into it or they're, they, mm-hmm. they don't want to follow Jesus. And they're looking at the kind of the political nonsense and the cultural nonsense of the religious right. And they use that as sort of their excuse. Okay. Like, I'm out of here. But in reality, they didn't want to be there in the first place. Can you name a few names? Well, I don't want to out anybody. <laughs> um, I, I mean, was, I, these, these I are people. I, I no, but kidding. I really, I've encountered these people since I was a college student, right? People yeah. raised in the church who go away to college and they realize, oh, well, you know, the church is backwards on this issue or that issue, or whatever. And they abandon the whole thing using that as their excuse. When in reality, they just don't want to follow Jesus. So there's those people, the disbelievers. Then there's the disillusioned. And these are folks, I think, who want to follow Jesus, but they, they've they been raised in an environment that made the whole thing a package deal. That if you're going to be a Christian, you have to be a Republican, you have to be on these sides of these moral issues or social issues, and it's all one solid package. And they think, if I give up any piece of this, like if I give up the political piece, I have to give up my faith altogether. And they're disillusioned because they didn't they don't have any really good examples of alternative ways of being a Christian apart from the whole package deal. And I I really empathize with those people. I think that's part of what this show is about is helping people realize, no, 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 you can be a faithful follower of Jesus and not take the whole package. So the disillusion. And then the third reason. We're like, we're like the cable unbundlers. We don't want the whole cable package. We just want Disney plus and you know, whatever. What are HBO Max? That's all we want. Right. Is that, well, the, is that a the good a la carte analogy? kind of thing? Not, Would you not like to use the, that analogy in your next book? Because I'll that's let a you. great analogy, Phil. But it's not that we're going a la carte or unbundling the theology. orthodox theology of the church. We're unbundling right. the cultural and political implications of it. So, and those disillusioned people. I feel bad for them because a lot of them, they're, they're the homeless. Like Mike Erie talks about the the spiritual or homeless people because they don't know where to right. go. But right. then there's the third category, and these are just called disciples. And they're people who are genuinely wanting to follow Jesus, like the disillusioned. And as they study scripture more deeply, as they study church history, as they look around the world of what's going on in the church, they come to the realization that faithfulness and following Jesus means I probably need to leave this tradition that is too captured by syncretism and Christian nationalism. So it's actually an obedience to being a disciple of Jesus that I'm leaving this tradition to go somewhere else. But they're not disillusioned because they found that other thing that is a better representation of what it means right. to follow Christ. Right. Okay. So there you can we lump all these people into the same category. What were the, we call what them were the three what, what were the three classifications again? Disbelievers, disillusioned and disciples. Oh, dis! I like a book in the making. No, it's a sermon. It's a th- uh, you know, it's an alliterated three point sermon. But <laughs> the problem is, we 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 jumble all these people together, and we just call them. Well, they're deconstructing, and we make it like right. a bad thing. But the people are deconstructing for different reasons, and the reason you deconstruct makes a huge difference. If it's because you just don't want to follow Jesus, that's right. very different than the person who's deconstructing because I really want to follow Jesus. But right. it can look the same when it's presented to an outsider. Yeah, that and is I have, a very I have, interesting point. Yeah, I have heard some people, you know, that are that are devout followers of Jesus saying I just, I'm leaving evangelicalism. You know, and I and I I don't want to discourage them, but I kind of want to say it's very hard to leave something that's so ill-defined. Yes. <clears throat> you know. Yeah. It's like how do you leave evangelicalism if we can't even define what it is? Right. Uh so, you know, I'm leaving 
typically what they mean is I'm leaving the specific tradition that either I grew up in or I was baptized into or I've been attending for the last seven or eight years. You yeah, know, but and- correct me if I'm wrong. Evangelicalism is well-defined. It, it has a definition. We've talked it about is. it before. Yeah. It's a classical definition. Yeah. The problem is it got like hijacked <laughs> right. somewhere at yeah. some point. Kind and of. So, there was a, there was an interesting article. Sorry to interrupt you, Christian. There was an interesting article uh, that was looking at some of the notes of Carl Henry and others when they were forming Christianity Today to define this neo evangelicalism and trying to figure out what what is our audience. And at the end of the day, they decided their audience was anyone who thinks favorably of Billy Graham. No, <laughs> <laughs> like that was pretty much it. It's not well now. We don't, now an evangelical is someone who thinks favorably of Franklin Graham. That's not an evangelical. Well, Ryan that's Birch, a, who who you know does all his research and posts on Twitter. So, I mean, he's been harping on this for a long, long time, including on our show. Like the definition of evangelical has basically been stripped of its theological and biblical origins. Yeah, and it now yeah. essentially means a conservative white Republican, and. I mean, the significant number of evangelicals who don't even attend church anymore, and not because of COVID, but just don't right. attend because it's right. not part of the definition. So I think Christian's point is accurate. It has become, it did have very clear definition at one point, but it's so muddled now that it has become more of a cultural and political identifier. So when people say they're leaving it, I, you got to go deeper with that person and ask, right. well, what is it you think you're leaving and why are you leaving it and where are you going? And is it for because example, you're actually following Jesus? For example, when uh, Beth Moore leaves Southern Baptist Convention and becomes Anglican, has she left evangelicalism? John Stott was Anglican and evangelical. Uh-huh. Yeah, it seems like a lot because there's tons of, of uh, Wheaton College faculty that are Anglican. It's, you know, it's all the cool kids are becoming Anglican now. Uh, so then the question is, because I'm wondering if they are basically saying, I want to associate myself with the evangelicalism of a John Stott or an N.T. Wright. You know, I, I want to be a British evangelical, not an American evangelical. <laughs> yeah. And if the best way to say that publicly is say, I'm Anglican, deal with it. I'm British evangelical now. Yeah. And interestingly, evangelicals in, in Britain tend to be more socially political, I mean, uh, progressive in their yeah. politics, whereas in America, evangelicals are known as very conservative in their politics. Yeah. Christian, I interrupted you very rudely. I'm sorry for that. Uh, continue. C- con- what, are you, what, are you, what are your thoughts? <laughs> I don't remember now, but thank you for apologizing. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> no, no, people I mean, are going to hammer me on Twitter. <laughs> you were so rude to Christian. You really uh, interrupted. I love people that care about me on Twitter. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> no, I mean, I just think Sky is voicing what I was basically saying. And because I feel like I'm in that category myself. Yeah. You know, when I think about being an evangelical, it's what my core religious beliefs are. You know, not my political beliefs. Those are unbundled for me. And so yeah. I look in society and I see now they're commingled with this Christian nationalism. And that's not evangelicalism to me. And it's not me. But I don't want people to put me in that basket. But I still feel like if you ask me what my Christian beliefs are, they would look like traditional evangelical Christian beliefs. But I would be, I guess, now as I'm learning on this podcast, more politically, you know, religiously left, I guess. I'm a red letter Christian. I suppose I'm, you know. Yeah. On the left. It's it's hard. It's hard to define. It's hard to define. And it's hard, you know, and and I've been so frustrated that if I take a position that's counter to conservative American politics, people immediately assume, oh, well, you're a liberal Democrat. It's like, well, I didn't say that. I didn't say, I just, I, on that one issue. So to summarize, evangelicalism is ill-defined. People are leaving it for different reasons. Sky has three buckets from a, is that an upcoming sermon or a sermon you've already given? No, no, no. This is just my, my thoughts that I. You said it was a sermon. You said, I said it, it could be points. because it's. Oh, I was joking. Be, yeah. Okay. Because it's. Okay. You know, three alliterated there, points. There was another study, recent study that I thought was inter- interesting that actually showed in a study of uh, the Clinton Trump election and people's moral beliefs and assessment of the candidates' moral beliefs before, during, and after that 
supporters of Donald Trump actually adjusted their moral beliefs to adapt to Donald Trump's moral beliefs. And supporters of Hillary Clinton did not show that same change in behavior. So there was a, there was a question, do people project their own moral beliefs onto the candidate that they've decided they support? Or do they assume the moral beliefs of the candidate they've decided to support and actually change their own moral beliefs? And they found in the case of Hillary Clinton, people were projecting their moral beliefs onto her. In the case of Donald Trump, people were taking on the moral beliefs of Donald Trump to justify support for him. And considering that the biggest block of Trump supporters were white evangelicals, it's a little concerning that white evangelicals were willing to adjust their own morality to match a candidate who was never known for being a moral person. But aren't both kind of problematic? Yes. Like when we project our moral beliefs onto a leader or a candidate, which that person may or may not actually hold, we're so, sort of self-deluding ourselves into believing, well, that person thinks the way I do, and therefore they're worth voting for. Whereas in the opposite, we're changing our moral beliefs in order to deal with the cognitive dissonance with the person I'm putting. But they're both problematic. Uh, yeah. We don't we don't like cognitive dissonance between us and the people we're voting for. Right. We want to believe that they're good people and that we're making a good choice, so therefore we're good people. Right. But we actually, you see both things happening with the Trump side of it, because remember all the rhetoric around, well, he's a baby Christian and he has accepted Jesus. And it, there was a lot of projection going on there where people wanted him to be more like them as yeah. well. So it's, it, But you're right. It's all around that cognitive dissonance and how do I reconcile it? And it's just creepy. The whole That's what really bugs me the most about faith and politics across the spectrum, doesn't matter, on the right or the left, Yeah, is no one's willing to just let these candidates be what they are. They, everyone has to make it all nice and clean and simple. And that just isn't reality. Yeah. I really had hoped we wouldn't have to ever talk about Donald Trump again, but he's not going away. And we're in a midterm election year. So... It's going to come up, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. So what can we do? Sky, give us give us one piece of advice to wrap this up. Everything you sound like me, Phil. Thank you. Yes, what can we... <laughs> Christian wants to know, she's kicking me under the table. Christian wants to know what from Montana, because there's big sky and long legs. Christian wants to know what can we do to to be part of the solution? I don't know. <laughs> oh guy christian what can we do to be part of the solution bring some moral heart to this discussion to wrap it up today so i have been thinking a lot about this situation yeah and i think first listening to you guys sort of explain the answers to some of my questions is a start because then it brings things you know, into clarity for me to understand better what all these definitions are and where people are. And when I think we have a better understanding of where other people are, it gives us a little bit more compassion, a little bit more humility, and a little bit more willingness to discuss, which I think are Christian qualities. And, you know, the other thing is, I need to completely be centered on who Christ is and what he wants me to be in this world today. And it always starts with my relationship with him, grounding myself in scripture, trying to figure out um, how to walk in his way with these people that differ from me and realizing that the answers really are not to be found in politics, are they? Oh, you're good right. answer. You're I right. think See, I, Sky, can't, why can't you give an answer like that? I can, I've been thinking now. I just wasn't prepared. And Chris, Christian's words kind of sparked some thoughts because I totally concur with what she said. If I could summarize Christian's comment in one Please word do. that also starts with a D so I can continue my alliteration, it's differentiation. Oh. We have to do the hard work of differentiating our faith from our politics, differentiating our faith from our culture differentiating our faith from our parents, as we talked about with the daddy issues and Falwell, differentiating our faith from the tradition that we may have 
been formed in and recognize that you can hang on to faith in Christ without having all of those other things bundled together. And yeah. for some of us, we look, for example, at our parents and the homes or traditions we grew up in and overwhelmingly are filled with gratitude for all the goodness and godliness that we inherited from that. Wonderful. Some of us look at it and go, oh my gosh, they were total hypocrites and the tradition was a total mess and and we have to differentiate and that's okay. You can, you can still follow Jesus and have that baggage there and, and separate it out. But we have to do that hard work of differentiation, differentiating ourselves from our faith, from our candidates, as you just talked about. But until we do that, we're going to keep getting these things confused and we're not going to see Jesus clearly. And that's going to be a real challenge to our discipleship. And can I just sum up with one other thing? Yes, what sum up said, in one word what Sky just said. I can't do that. Okay. But what you just said, Sky, reminded me of this thing that I read in Oswald Chambers this morning, which is we so often want to be good people, do good things, you know, reflect the character of Christ. And in some ways, that is a reflection of what we want to be. You know, we want to be good and we want to be on the right side and all of that. Ultimately, if we made Christ our aim, as opposed to being good or being in the right political class or the right religious group, if we made being with Christ and you know our aim, the side benefit is we would be filled with His goodness, and we would be living out you know His life in the culture around us. Good word. So it sounds like you're saying it's not about rules; it's about relationship. I am. All and right. it's about being with God. With, with. Right. Everyone go buy Sky's book. <laughs> with God daily. Daily. com. With God daily. <laughs> All rights reserved, <laughs> trademarked. All trademarked, <laughs> void where prohibited, mm -hmm. not available in Australia because <laughs> it was stolen by a dingo. Okay. Thanks for coming. We got a great guest. There's going to be an interview. You're going to love it and you're going to learn a lot. So don't go away. And we'll talk to you next week. Bye, everybody. The Holy Post is brought to you by our listeners who support us on Patreon. This episode is also sponsored by our friends at Faithful Counseling. We can all agree the last couple of years have been nuts. Sure, you can unload all your troubles on your best friend or your cat or that David Hasselhoff poster on your wall. But what if you could talk to a trained professional? Nothing against your cat or David Hasselhoff, but Faithful Counseling is a Christian counseling service with more than 3,000 licensed therapists across all 50 states. And you don't have to go into an office. You can schedule secure video or phone sessions. Plus, you can chat and text with your therapist. With expertise in depression, stress, anxiety, trauma, family conflicts, and more. Not happy with your counselor? Ask for a new one at any time. Financial aid is available for those who qualify. Plus, Holy Post listeners get 10% off your first month from our sponsor, Faithful Counseling. What have you got to lose? Give it a try. Go to faithfulcounseling.com slash holypost. Just fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs, and you'll get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's faithfulcounseling.com slash holypost. And now, back to the show. There's been a lot of data recently that shows there's a rising biblical illiteracy in the church, which couldn't come at a worse time because many people in our society are asking questions about the Bible, like, is it anti-woman, anti-science? Is it all about violence? And does it even endorse slavery? How are we supposed to answer those tough questions if we ourselves don't really know what's in the Bible? That's the premise of my friend Dan Kimball's new book, How Not to Read the Bible, making sense of the anti-women, anti-science, pro-violence, pro-slavery, and other crazy-sounding parts of scripture. And the great part is it's not just a book, but also a streaming video series in six sessions that's super accessible for you, your home group, your church, your youth group. I highly recommend you check it out. Dan has been on the staff at Vintage Faith Church in Santa Cruz, California for many years, and he's also on the faculty of Western Seminary. In my conversation, you're going to hear about his own interactions with young people and their questions about the Bible, and you'll hear Dan's own story of how he came to faith in the most unexpected way while a rockabilly pop artist in London. That experience helped him realize that being hospitable and welcoming of young people's doubts is critical if the church is to engage them meaningfully and answer their tough questions about the Bible. Here's my conversation with Dan Kimball. Dan Kimball, welcome to the Holy Post. Uh, thank you, and welcome to uh, talking to me in Santa Cruz, California. <laughs> 
It's yeah. been too long. We we yeah. used to see each other more regularly at ministry conference events and different things I did at CT and leadership, but I don't know the last time we were together. So it's great having you back. Yes. Well, I followed you from afar and listened to your uh, profound thinking. Actually, I'm not just joking about that. I, I really respect your thinking. So it's great. Well, to that's kind. Be and and bef- yeah. before we started recording, you were telling me that you're about to celebrate your 18th anniversary at Vintage Faith Church, which, I mean, that's that's not common these days for any pastor to be somewhere that long, let alone a founding pastor. Tell me about the church. How's it going? Yeah. Well, uh, prior to Vintage Faith Church, I was at Santa Cruz Bible Church in Santa Cruz for 13 years. And then we started Vintage Faith Church as a church plant from Santa Cruz Bible. So I've been in the same town for 31 years on church staff and still with Vintage Faith Church. Um, So we're still, I mean, it's been like, I use the word, it's an adventure every day, and that makes it never dull <laughs> and uh, and wonderful in many ways. So still still well, there. And it sounds like your experience with a lot of people there is what led you to write this book, How Not to Read the Bible, and the video series that came out of it, which I want to get into in a minute. But it, it's really drawing out of the fact that more and more people are using various parts of the Bible to justify not believing it, criticizing it. So can you share... A couple of stories or instances of encounters you had with people that made you realize this is an issue we have to address more satisfyingly in the church? Yeah, the writing of the book and then the videos all came out of being in ministry in a college town and listening to questions that come up, both from Christians and non Christians. And, uh, you know, it started just even years ago when you started, I, I once was, uh, when I was serving and I had some emails that were coming in and asking questions about Levitical laws. And there are detailed questions that were written out and it's kind of the typical ones like, should I not eat shrimp? What about, uh, um, you know, two, you know, two types of crops side by side and all of these things saying, do we really pick and choose? And I took the time to answer each one back. I ended up saying like, I can't keep answering each of these questions. What if we meet in person? And it turned out it was a junior hire. And that was so profound to me because I'm like a junior hire and he found a website called evilbible.com. It's still up there. And he went on the website and he was pulling off all of these difficult passages that were now being pointed out. And it was kind of like slamming the Bible as being evil, not a good book. And so I'm like a junior hire. So I started even paying attention to this and then started not just hearing, you know, a, a unique junior hire. I don't think most junior hires do that, but you know, uh, starting, t- I met a college student um, who left the their. Um, they had a parachurch ministry on campus, and heard from the leader, and they said one of our uh, the main leader, and they said one of our student leaders just uh, announced that he's leaving faith and he's agnostic or atheist and can't serve anymore. Would you meet with him? And I listened to his story, and it was really fascinating, which I think is kind of typical. I don't want to say every, every not everybody has different stories, but. What I saw the patterns of is he was in a a great church. I knew a church it was over in San Jose. He was involved in the youth group. Um, It wasn't a boring church. It was very relevant. He was in the band and good music, all of that. He got to the university, and then he started studying the book of Exodus. He starts studying the book of Exodus uh, up on the university. All of a sudden, these questions were confronting him about God killing uh, the, the firstborn of the Egyptians. And his question, he said, was so interesting. Why do we recoil back in horror when we hear about Herod killing the children in Bethlehem, you know, the the under two-year-old? Why is it okay for God to do that with Egyptians? And he said that really was difficult for him to start thinking about. Then he saw the passages about slavery, you know, and, and, and people being seen as property. And then it just started unfolding. And then he went online, and the, I'm not exaggerating, or any, what did he? What website did he find? Evilbible.com. Because like, he types in these questions, and then there's yeah. all of the information. And his faith just started unraveling. And then he gave a whole bunch of different other reasons. You know, he started paying attention to verses about, you know, women being silent in the church. You know, you have to go home and ask your husband the question. Mm-hmm. You know, Corinthians and, and I think what's happened is, especially because of the internet, is that there's acts. There's more pointing out aggressively of all of these things in the Bible that were not, they were always there, but they weren't pointed out as much. And I think we have a generation or two that was raised up, not having those things focused on and kind of skimmed over 
not really addressed. And then they're really confronting people and it's causing them great, catching them off guard with great struggles of understanding what this Bible is and is God really evil and anti-women and pro-slavery and violent and all of those things. So that's why I ended up uh, writing the book and the videos. Yeah, I, I watched a couple of the videos, and the the first session you mentioned the same story of this student who started reading the Book of Exodus in college and had that that interesting and and very relevant question about the, the genocide of the infants with with um, Herod versus in Egypt. But um, to clarify something, the student wasn't reading Exodus in a secular university class. It wasn't like some non-believing professor was embedding these doubts in the student's mind through the classroom. He was in, he's engaged in a Bible study through a parachurch, I assume evangelical ministry that was studying the book of Exodus. So this yes. was, yes, this wasn't the influence of the world on him making him no. doubt these things. It was just his own curiosity about scripture. Yeah. And, and this, this is some of the thing. And again, these are somewhat common as I've paid attention to this now for several years. He then asked his leader, and his leader's like, I'm not sure how to answer that. And then his yeah. friends, and they didn't have answers, you know. And then he heard one of his leaders uh, said something like, well, in heaven one day you'll know the answer. And he just said that didn't, you know, settle yeah. right with him. And that just, and of course, that's when you start questioning, you know, that's in Fowler's stages right. of faith growth. You know, you those are all great times. And, and all of these questions are very valid. They're very, very valid. So, and they're very understandable. Um, yeah. So this was not again that started that way, but then there was a, a a massive amount of information against the Bible that he then found to back up, you know, those things. Yeah, like 10, 10 15 years ago, there was a lot of um, stuff coming out from the new atheist movement. People like Richard Dawkins, and he he would advocate. He told people read the Bible. Yep. And and he said for two reasons. Number one, you should read the Bible because this book and its literature has influenced a lot of Western civilization and a lot of Western literature. So you need to know the Bible to understand just your culture. But he then would say, read the Bible because it, you'll see it's a horrific book and the God depicted in it is a monster. And and he said it's the greatest manual for making atheists. And And I think that sort of planted the seed for a bunch of people to create websites and memes and other stuff that would plant that that perspective in the minds of young people, especially who are at an age to begin to question things. But let me ask you this, how much do you think uh, the church itself is a factor here? And what I mean by that mm -hmm. is, I mean, in this young man's experience, when he went to his spiritual leaders with questions, they didn't have answers, which was troubling enough. But secondly, there's a lot of evidence coming out of places like Barna and the American Bible Society and elsewhere that shows even Americans who go to church, they don't open their Bibles very much, and they're right. not being taught the Bible very much. So if you're a kid growing up in that kind of environment where Christianity is more or less taught with a bunch of cliches or you know statements that can fit in a tweet or on a coffee mug, and then you get to be 18, 19, 20 years old and start asking bigger questions, you open up the Bible really meaningfully for the first time, and you're confronted with genocide and slavery and what looks like horrific treatment of women is it's part of it our own fault in the church because we haven't prepared young people for how to engage scripture yep i mean i i the, not all churches there are some churches that have been amazingly faithful sure. and making sure from a younger age they um they learn you know some of these questions as well um but the broader church i would say um, and this is, I do think, church leaders, and I can be guilty of this myself through these seasons of ministry. But I think what we've done is we so focused on relevance, you know, and um, you know, very uh, helpful messages using scripture. We have focused, you know, all the video venue craze, and everybody was launching new video venues, and like all of these different things that we're focusing on, even even. Uh, even social justice type of ministries and things like all of these things that the church was focusing on. And at the same time, you had Richard Dawkins back that time, the people weren't, the average 21 year old was not reading a Richard Dawkins book. Yeah. However, the average 21 year old now is on TikTok, seeing tons of messages coming through on uh, Pinterest and Facebook and Instagram, seeing all these different memes. There's various websites. 
So now the the academic sort of I'm only going to be reading that stuff is now seeped into pop culture, easy access, and I and many aren't prepared to answer it. So I do think a lot of churches did not prepare for this type of thing. And I think my my opinion is that most churches have great doctrinal statements, but if you had to actually, um, I might have heard you say this actually. It, uh, that many churches have solid doctrinal statements, but if you were to survey the beliefs of most in the church, they wouldn't match the doctrinal statements. Mm. Yeah, I think that's the case, and in, in, in certainly not just in churches, but probably in most religious communities of all stripes. Mm-hmm. Right? We we don't do a great job of forming people apart from the media. Um, I heard okay, so I heard a political consultant years ago, forget where, was talking about. Um, political controversies or scandals. And he said that the the most dangerous scandals for a politician are the scandals that reinforce the assumptions people already had about the politician. So Mm -hmm. uh, you think back to the 1990s and Bill Clinton, right? A lot of people had the assumption that he was kind of a philanderer and, and loose with his sexual morality. And there had been kind of rumors and stories for years and years. And then the Monica Lewinsky scandal hits. And they said the reason it was so devastating is because it was confirming what a lot of people had already suspected. Um, and you can go on to other politicians and their scandals. But the reason I bring that up is because it seems like a lot of the broader culture, the broader secular culture, has sent the message that Christianity and Christians in particular are retrograde and they're um, you know they have discriminatory views of minorities and women. Uh, they are homophobic and they want to pull the whole society back into some patriarchal nonsense. And, and so th- these kind of vibes permeate throughout the, the culture. And when a young person is marinating that all the time, and then perhaps for the first time they open up the Bible and they read some of the stories that you mention in your book, whether it's you know the killing of the firstborn in Exodus, or some of these other horrific stories—the genocide of the conquest, other things like that. They go, "Oh my gosh, all those rumors I heard about Christians and Christianity in the Bible are true." I'm out of here. Yep. So, it, it seems like the issue here isn't just how people read or don't read the Bible. It's also what are they hearing or not hearing from the broader culture around them. What do we do about that side of it? Because it seems like your book does an excellent job at helping them address the Bible, but if they're already biased against the faith because of what they've been around, how far can we get? Well, I think, it, you know, if I'm a follower of Jesus, and then I believe that God inspired, you know, the Holy Spirit through people, you know, wrote the scriptures over time, that then that's a premise of starting my 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 viewpoints of life. So, um, what, no matter what the culture is, if we were living over in Iran or if we were living in a, um, a Hindu section of India or wherever it might be, we are, the worldview around us may be different than what's in the scripture. So it's going to be different depending on where we are. And that's why under, making sure we're faithfully teaching what the Bible is and how to address the Christian, the I, I say this because all of these words are loaded, like the biblical worldview. And like, but then depending on who you ask, you might get a different worldview that's saying that's what the Bible says. But um, I guess my answer is just saying that the culture around us is always going to be shifting and changing. And right now we're facing a whole bunch of other things. And yes, a person is immersed in the pressure of what it means to be in our culture today. Therefore, this all the more reason we need to be in scripture to see what is in alignment with culture and what isn't in alignment with culture and, and have the confidence of what's, what God has given us in scripture for guidance. Have you, have you encountered much from Jonathan Haidt? He's a sociologist, is he, I forget what his exact field is, sociology or psychology. Um, he wrote the, the Righteous Mind. Nope, I have not uh, read that. Okay, well, Jonathan Haidt, I think he's an atheist. At least he's not a believer, but he's very sympathetic to believers. And one of the th- points he makes, he, he's talking about why do people have such strong disagreements about things like politics and religion. Mm-hmm. And his argument is most people don't actually make rational decisions about their beliefs. They make more emotional decisions. Yes. And when, for example, somebody if somebody really wants to be a Christian or really wants to follow Jesus, they will then concoct or gravitate toward the arguments that validate that decision on the flip side, if somebody really doesn't want to follow Jesus or be in the church or a Christian, they will also then line up the arguments that justify that 
decision. Yes. Yes. I bring that up because how like there's so much in the Bible. There's so many stories and there's so many interpretive frameworks for those stories. It seems to me that if a young person today really doesn't want to follow Jesus or take the Bible and its authority for their life, then they could easily engage it and pull out the most horrific pieces out of context and justify abandoning it. Um, so when you encounter some of these people or you've had these conversations, do you ever have to kind of dig beneath the surface and go, is this person really asking me a question about, you know, can I eat shrimp in Leviticus or, you know, growing different kinds of crops together or even what the Bible says about homosexuality? Or is this really an attempt to just justify not having to follow Jesus? I mean, I do think it's uh, a mix. Uh, that's why I kind of earlier said, like each there's individual stories. It's all like the deconstruction type of things. There's mm -hmm. there's different reasons. You know, often there's church hurt. You know, somehow in the church involved, there could be. I really don't. I feel too much cultural pressure about certain things, and I don't want to be seen as a hateful person. So therefore, right. I'm now seeing other ways to look at the Bible, or you know. So I th I think there's a lot of that. Um, and it is sifting through what what's really going on with somebody, uh, you know, in because you can also provide. I, I can. I, there are things in the Bible, and I I say this when I wrote this. Also, the hardest part in the scriptures to understand for me is the violence, and by far, God did use violence. God yeah. did. There's death, you know, unless you're going to be Marcion and rip it out, you know, or say like, nope, that wasn't him, or what is happening. This is what, you know, like, well, God, that was the people's understanding of what God did. So God didn't really command that violence. It was just what they thought he would want them to do. Then you're looking at scripture entirely different, and then you can come to all kinds of conclusions. But I do think um, there are certain difficult things that we just have to say, I don't know the full responses to, and then, but a lot of them we can. And I do think that's where you see are people using the tough things in the scripture as a way of, you know, I really am not feeling comfortable with faith anymore and I don't want to be a hateful person or something, you know, mm -hmm. or are they sincerely seeking like, is this true? I'm struggling. Is this really what? Yeah. So I, that's why I have to talk to individuals to kind of find out. But I do think, all right, uh, see, I came, I wasn't raised in a church. I came to faith later. And I share a little bit sometimes my story. Like my, I had one, uh, one time when I started reading a Bible, and my friends were asking me, "Am I joining a cult?" Right. So, and I had to like, "Am I?" Because people in cults don't know they're in cults, right? Because you're like, and I'm like, because they raised up valid concerns at that time. It was like all of the end time stuff was going on. It's like, you know, you think you're waiting for Armageddon, and you're going to lose all your creativity. You remember these things they were saying, and I'm like, you know, and you believe in a dead man that came back, like, you know, and hearing it like that, I'm like is this a cult? And it forced me to look at origins of scripture. Why am I getting into this? Cause I didn't want to join a cult, you know? So, <laughs> and, and, and so I think that is, those are good questions that we have to face at some point. Uh, and, and, and I, in, in some way, I, I got to be careful when I say this, I once said to some, I, I posted something once. I'm like, I'm actually glad for the new atheists because it causes Christians to think. And I'm um, <laughs> all right. And then I had a dad talk to me and said, you know, it's nice for you to say, but my daughter is now an atheist because she got confused by some of it. And I'm yeah. like, oh, okay, I can't just uh, say that as non-thoughtful uh, or however I said it. But I do think it's actually a good thing because it does cause Christians to think. And, I, and this is going to sound uh, – we can talk a whole hour on this. I still wonder – because we've gotten so good in the church machine of things, how many people are into, how many people don't, all right, uh, uh, all right, I'll just say it, like, uh, how many people <laughs> don't really know Jesus that are in churches, but they're in more of the, I'm getting the endorphins from all the music's music, right. and I'm feeling good about it, and I can sing these songs and have the buzz from all of that. And it feels like the Holy spirit. Maybe it's just, you know, you're hearing these stories. And then when that starts wearing off, it's like, what a, am I really grounded in a, I don't say this in a cliche way in a relationship, Holy yeah. spirit and, you know, like regenerated uh, way. And is it easier to, 
to not when that's not there because when that stuff wears off where you know are you really there so yeah no i i couldn't agree with you more it was my years as a pastor that convinced me that getting simply getting people into the church wasn't the goal because i had gotten to know people in my church i had seen conflicts and controversies in my church and I had known people in the church for decades, and what you end up sometimes finding is these people don't actually have a communion with God. Right. And I'm not saying that's true of everybody, but you can't just assume because somebody comes to church regularly or they're a member that they have a fruitful communion with God. And um, and that, I mean that's why I wrote my book with, which was really all about that. So you're right. You can't you can't take that for granted. Um, it, one of the things I like about your this book and the video series you did is that we've had we've had scholars on here to talk about some of these issues like John Walton and and David Lamb and you know getting into some of the really nitty gritty exegesis of these texts and the scholarly work behind them. You do that too, but you put the cookies on a lower shelf. Like yeah. this is you've made this really accessible for people, and you've always had a very gentle demeanor and a pastoral kind of posture about yourself, Dan, and and that comes through in the video. You just somebody who's 17 years old and struggling with some of these questions could read this book or watch your videos and engage it. And they don't have to have a PhD in, in old Testament to get it, which is super helpful. Right. I am guessing part of that comes from your own story. And I, years and years ago, you told me some of your conversion story and you just alluded to it. Now I'd love for you to share a little bit of that and how it helps you relate to people who are struggling with their faith and your desire to, to walk with them the next step. If I recall, you told me the story about being in London. Yep. And and a and a church experience. I'm getting this right, aren't I? Yes, you are. Okay. Can you fill in some of that story for people and connect it to what you're trying to do with this book? Yeah. Well, right next to me, I'm looking at it to my right. Um, in fact, I'll just show you because you can see it right there. Uh, well, it's, is the fellow in London, England, who is an 82 year old pastor in a tiny little elderly church. And I was in a punk and rockabilly band living in London and I was just starting to explore faith. And, um, you know, my, I I was, you know, dressing punk rockabilly, the whole, everything. And I walked into this little church building and cause they had a sign outside that said Bible study today, 12 o'clock. And it was some handwritten little scroll thing. And so I'm like, I'm, I'm interested in this. What is it? And I walked in and I saw three elderly people and I would have walked out and just said wrong room. And all I know is like, I guess I'm like, what's this? Like, and the, the guy that I just put his, showed his picture up, um, he looked up at me and he just said like here for the study. And when he said that, I'm like, okay. And I sat down and that began a, uh, uh they were elderly folks and they never made me feel bad about asking a question. I can still remember the feeling of like, turn to the book of Acts. And I'm like, I have no idea where that is. And having to look at the table of contents and, you know, to find out like where, what page is it on? And, and they made me feel no question was bad to ask. They went out of their way to meet with me, you know, and it was really through an elderly small church in London, England that befriended a 23 year old, 24 year old, you know, punk band member and, and because they made questioning a good thing and they were gentle about it, they didn't judge me for what I was dressing like or anything. Um, and that stuck with me. But here's what I know. They were intelligent. They took mm. the scripture so seriously. If we were look, talking about something in the book of Acts, they'd pull out a map and say, look, here's where Paul went from here to here. And so they knew what they believed. And that was really important to me. So that stayed with me ever since because you wouldn't think an, ev- an evangelic. Uh, I'm sorry, a strategy for evangelism in London, England to how do you reach a punk rocker, you know, in London is, you know, have an elderly church and they served Ovaltine too. That's all I like, you know. <laughs> You're kidding. Yeah. Well, and first they gave me a cup and they handed it to me. And it was like one of the first things I'm like, I, I felt nervous. I drank it so fast. And then they looked at, they looked at each other and they filled up the cup again. And um, it was in a thermos. And then they, I started worrying because I'm like, what if I just walked into a cult and they were just drugged me and I'm going <laughs> like up in the basement of this place and then chained and they're going to be like poking me with sticks or something. But they were just, it was just an odd thing. So Ovaltine, 
and an elderly church is what God used to bring me to a saving knowledge of who Jesus is and understand the gospel and, and be, have a local church, a tiny little church of 15 people was major in my, my following Jesus. I, I love that story for so many reasons. And I recall when, when you first shared it with me, I don't know where we were, but we were younger for sure. We were younger pastors and we were kind of of that cohort of, um, we were the, the innovators, the younger people doing new stuff. And, and the big message that a lot of us received was we needed to be relevant. We had to be relevant. We had to make the church more relevant to the culture. And, and then you share the story of these three old people in London who couldn't have been more different than you mm -hmm. being the instruments God used to bring you to himself. Right. And just a reminder that God works through all kinds of people in all kinds of ways and, and relevance isn't always the most important quality. I mean, they showed you hospitality, kindness, um, patience. Yep. They welcomed your questions. As you put it, they didn't expect you to change your appearance and your hair. You still have your hair, thank goodness, unlike me, but it was taller. I remember even some years ago, you had even more of it. <laughs> right. um, I'm sure that you walked in that door and they had all kinds of thoughts going through their mind, but they, they loved you and met you where you were. And it's just a beautiful story of the church being the church. Well, and that's why I keep his picture up next to my desk. I have it up here and in uh, in the church office away at, as well. I'm at home right now because I never want to forget that. You know, God's Spirit can use an elderly church in London. Um, there was no, uh, you know, fancy lights or video screens. Now, I'm not saying those things are bad, but that's yeah. those are, you know, they used Ovaltine, and now we might have video screens or something. Right. So, but, but yep. But that, that ability to welcome your questions and not judge your doubts and um, not shame you for your ignorance, all those things are incredibly applicable today to the questions that you're facing with young people and I'm facing and others, and, and largely why you wrote your book. We could spend hours talking about some of the specific stories in here and issues. You do a great job of covering things like uh, violence in the Bible. You mentioned slavery, is the Bible anti-science, all that. And we've covered many of those issues on past um episodes of the Holy Post. One I want to talk about though, which we don't cover as often, is the question of exclusivity. And the fact that especially in our pluralistic culture today, mm -hmm. where, you know, it's the UBU kind of message and everyone needs to just get along and and the worst thing you can be is is somebody who thinks someone else is wrong in some way. This exclusivity of the message of the Bible, a lot of people get hung up on. Walk us through some of the ways you you address that. Um both in the book, but even in just your pastoral vocation and in your conversations with people when they bring it up, how do you address it? Yeah, well, what you said, I mean, we are in the day of, you know, that uh, saying there is a truth and maybe there's non-truths out there is not very acceptable. Uh, people are thinking or I'm sorry, feeling more than looking at, you know, we're led by our feelings and emotions. My feelings and emotions would lead me to say, everybody's okay. You know, like all different world faiths or as long as you're putting some effort into believing something, then that's okay. You know, and that's, that's my natural tendency of what I would b believe. Um, however, if I'm, if I believe the scriptures are from God and, and I have all different reasons for believing, you know, why I believe they are true. And that's the actual story of humanity, uh, of, of who God is, of salvation, Jesus, you know, all of these things. If I believe that's true, then that, that does set a framework for how you then view the birth of other religions or other opinions and faiths. And so um, most people I know, and then being, again, in man, many interactions, have never really explored like the origins of all world faiths or where did they all come from or understand the Bible as narrative and that really changes everything. So I guess what I'm saying, it's a giant topic, is very carefully listening to people, not backing down in, in the truth of the storyline of the whole Bible. Um, and then the reality is, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Christian church was birthed in a very polytheistic world. So it yeah. wasn't like, so it's almost, what did they do back then? So it's not unique to our time today. But we also then can look at the book of Acts and say, what did they say back then? And we kind of use that pattern because they were in a polytheistic, multi-view world. Uh, and they were saying there is one Savior, one God, 
And that was not a message. That was the common message back in in the, the book of Acts in the early church. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important point. The, the persecution of Christians in the, in the Roman Empire was not because they believed in Jesus. It was because they believed in the exclusivity of Jesus. Right. What they wanted was, hey, yeah, you can have your Jewish Messiah, you can do your, your Christian stuff, but we need you to also pledge allegiance to Caesar. And when Christians said, no, we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, not Caesar is Lord, that was, that's the violation. That was the, the political uh, teeth of the gospel that got them in trouble. It's the exclusivity. And the same thing's true today. I remember walking down the street in Mumbai when I was a teenager, and there was a shrine built around a tree, which is not that uncommon. And around the shrine were all these depictions of various deities, Hindu deities. Um, and there was Jesus you know, just thrown into the mix and like Hinduism is fine. Yeah. Jesus, bring them in. We're happy. The more, the merrier. But when you suddenly say, no, 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 Jesus demands our exclusive allegiance. That's where things get kind of hairy and troubling. Um, I had a conversation with a young person some years ago and her problem was not so much the exclusivity of the Christian message. It was the hypocrisy with which that exclusivity was carried. And, And here's what I mean. She, like the student you mentioned earlier, grew up in a Christian home, had a more or less positive experience as a, in the youth group of her, of her teenage years, um, goes off to a secular university and for the first time in her life develops meaningful relationships with non-Christians. And she said things like, you know, I've, I've met Muslims and Jews and non-believers of whatever, and they're, they're wonderful people. They're good people. They're kind. They're generous. They're my dear friends. And yet I know people in my church, older adults who she felt like were mean, bigoted, hypocritical, homophobic, judgmental, arrogant, all that. And she said at the end of the day, how can I believe in the exclusivity of Christianity when the non-believers I know are nicer than the Christians, <laughs> many of the Christians I know? Sure. How do you deal with that where it isn't so much a question about what the Bible is saying, but what we who claim the Bible are doing? Well, I think it, it, I think you come down to church cultures, and I think that's mm. very real. I mean, I, I uh, even when I say atheist, I normally say like 98% of atheists are really nice, kind, loving people. <laughs> like, And there's like 2% that are more of the militant, I'm going to try to prove Christianity wrong types. So I think we have to always... You know, because I've heard people like those atheists and, you know, I know atheists that are kind and loving and gentle and they're not trying to disprove Christianity wrong. They're just minding their own business. Um, But the same thing with Christians, there are those that are mean, um, judgmental and all of those things. But then you have to just say, then they are not following the teachings of the New Testament. And uh, and that's I would just keep coming back to what is the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament and then base your judgment of there's people that don't follow them. And they're unfortunately the ones that become, uh, affect people negatively, understandably so. And that means we should be living out to be kind and to be loving and, uh, and follow what judgmental means in scripture or not. So that's, you know, tomorrow in our church, we are, um, I'm sorry, Sunday in our church, like I'm teaching, we're giving out a missionary, uh, a blank missionary form. And I do this every every couple of years where we're going to say, like, if you were a missionary in Santa Cruz, California, and and I'm, I'm even saying, if you're not a Christian in this room, please understand, like, this, uh, what, how would you be, want to be known for? What are your relationships? And almost like a missionary report of what do you like there? Because how we live our lives is critically important. So unfortunately, what you're saying is true. <laughs> I don't want to come back. Yeah. And I think it's then churches need to make sure they're teaching what does it mean to really follow Jesus and be loving and kind and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And, yeah. that's, and it's sad. But then Christians need to know when somebody isn't, don't blame the church or the, then go to find another church. Find it. Don't realize that there's others that most aren't mean and judgmental and all of those things. Some are for sure, but most aren't. Yeah. And, and hang out with those that aren't. I want to just say something you said earlier. When you said something about like with Jesus, I think one of the the most dangerous things happening in t- today is people are saying Jesus, but
but it's not the biblical Jesus. Hmm. It's little bits and pieces. So it's like my Jesus would say this, my Jesus would do this. And they're saying it out of little bits, you know, like uh, of maybe some scriptural stories and certain things, but it's not the full Jesus. And I think that's, yeah. we can use Christian terminology. And I think that's very, uh, it's becoming pretty strong. And that's why knowing the Bible is really, really important. So you know the yeah. full Jesus. Right? Yeah. Voltaire once said that if God created us in his image, then we've returned the favor. Yeah. No, right. You know, we've remade Jesus in our image and then project that out instead. Again, the reason why we need to have our perceptions of him corrected by a faithful engagement with the Bible. Dan, That's thank you right. so much for this book and this resource. For those of you who've not picked it up, uh, you need to get it, How Not to Read the Bible. And I know we recommend a ton of books on this podcast. This is one I would not hesitate to give to my teenager or my college student. And the the video, the streaming videos, like I said, are super accessible, something you could watch as a family, a small group, a household, a youth group. Um, we've had scholars on to talk about really, really heady stuff. And Dan's a brilliant guy, but it sometimes takes more brilliance to take these things and make them accessible. So well done. Really grateful for that. And you told me before we were recording that you have another one in the works, which is how not to engage the church. How not to go to church. How not to go to church. So yes. when is that due? It's addressing all of I, I, one of the I think some of the, the biggest things that we're confused about today is like, what is church? And that's where, can you really be done with church? Can you follow Jesus, but not like church? Like all of these things like that. And it's really like, it's a, it's a pro-local church book, apologetic for the church, whether it's a house church or mega church, Anglican or pop rock, the local church is critical in someone's life. And I just, that's what this is. Well, we'll have you back on to talk yep. about that for sure. Dan Kimball, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Sky, and for your. Uh, you, I'm not. I'm not just saying this. You're, I often will refer to you as someone I so respect as a thinker, um, careful analyzer of culture and churches. So thank you for all you've been doing all these years. Thanks, Dan. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Holy Post Media. Production assistance by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash holy post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit HolyPost.com for show notes, news stories, Holy Post merchandise, and much more.